Hello, and thanks for joining us today for this webcast. Multi-alumics and biomarkers in rare diseases supporting development and commercialization of orphan drugs. Brought to you by Script and sponsored by Centergy. My name is Andrea Charles, Editor of Custom Content for Informer Pharma Intelligence, and I will be your moderator today. I would now like to introduce our presenters, Ovid Amate, Chief Business Officer, Centogene. Ovid serves as the Chief Business Officer with nearly three decades of broad commercial and development experience, focusing on orphan drugs for patients with rare genetic diseases. He has the overall responsibility for the company's pharmaceutical industry programs, including enhancing existing partnerships and establishing new collaborations to facilitate drug development and improve treatment outcomes. Also, we have Justin Bingham, Vice President of Business Development at Centergene. Justin leads the global team in developing pharmaceutical partnership strategies with the goal of maximizing value through accelerating and de-risking orphan drug programs for rare genetic diseases. And Dr. Peter Bauer, Chief Genomic Officer for Centrogene. Peter combines clinical and medical understanding in genetic testing with excellent knowledge of the latest scientific developments. Based on his extraordinary experience, especially in high throughput genetic testing using next generation sequencing, and with that, I'd like to hand things over. Ovid, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Andrea, and welcome to all of our listeners today. It's a pleasure to, uh, to have you on this uh, online uh, webinar. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time to join us today. Uh, and since Andrea already uh, introduced us, I will just uh, invite uh, my colleagues uh, to, uh, uh, to say hello so that you can recognize uh, their voices for the remaining of the webinar. Uh, Justin? Hi, uh, yes, this is Justin Bingham. Very happy to have everyone on the call. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. And uh, Dr. Peter Bauer? Uh, hello, this is Peter Bauer uh, calling in from Berlin in Germany. So uh, good day to everybody and thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. So um, in our, our webinar today, we will cover uh, the topics related to how uh, uh, we use multiomics approach in the development of biomarkers, ultimately to support the development and commercialization of orphan drugs. Um, as a public company, um, I'm obligated to uh, share this notice and disclaimers, but I will not be making uh, uh, any uh, future uh, looking uh, statements today, but in any uh, doubt, please refer to, uh, to these notices. So, um, in today's webinar, we will cover a number of, uh, of topics that we uh, thought would be uh, relevant for anyone interested in the develop development um, and the commercialization of orphan drugs. And specifically, we will talk about how we integrate the use of uh, genomics, metabolomics, and proteomics uh, for target discovery and validation, so at the very um, early stages of drug development. How can those biomarkers be developed rapidly? to enable patient identification, recruitment, and stratification in clinical studies. So this is how uh, we support the development, uh, the, the clinical development of a, uh, of a program. And of course, uh, later on, how can uh, those tools be used uh, to monitor the response to therapy and ultimately to improve um, the outcomes uh, for, uh, for the patient? And of course, uh, in a commercial setting, uh, can those uh, biomarkers uh, be used in a, in a way to, uh, to address the high-risk population to screen patients in an accurate and cost-effective way? So these are the topics that we will cover in today's webinar. Before we do that, I just wanted to, uh, to provide a, a quick overview to Centogene so that uh, um, you know um, uh, who it is that, uh, that's behind this, uh, this presentation. And on the right-hand uh, corner, you can uh, see our, um, our main offices and, uh, and the lab facility um, based in Rostock in the northern part of Germany. For those of you uh, who haven't been there, it's a beautiful location. And our building is uniquely designed in the, in the form of the, uh, the X chromosome, 
not only to remind us that uh, the genetics is at the core of what we do, but also to be functionally um, uh, useful to separate areas where we deal with uh, patient samples from areas that uh, do not. Uh, the company was founded back in 2006 by Professor Arndt Rawls, who's a neurologist and was always interested in the link between genetics and, um, and neurological diseases. Today we have uh, operations in Germany, as I already mentioned, and, uh, and operations in Boston in our lab in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We also have operations in Vienna, Dubai, and Delhi. And at this point we have um, more than 450 employees around uh, those locations, and uh, we have more than 50 nationalities represented in our workforce. Our lab is kept and clear accredited in, uh, in our diagnostic facility in, uh, in Cambridge. And we also have a biobank that's accredited uh, that is based in, in Rostock, in Germany. We employ a number of dif different techno technology platforms. And, uh, and at this point, we have uh, more than uh, 39 different par partnerships with different pharmaceutical and biotech companies. And uh, as recent as last fall, we became a public, uh, publicly traded company traded on the NASDAQ. So what are the needs uh, in the rare disease uh, space to develop uh, drugs uh, effectively? Uh, very, uh, very often uh, people refer to, uh, to orphan, uh, as rare diseases as orphan drugs, and this is because uh, the patient populations are are typically very small. That's really the definition um, of an orphan drug. So one of the needs is obviously access to patients. Of course, uh, many of those diseases are genetically based, so having a, a holistic and ethnically diverse uh, database is incredibly important. But really the major challenge is always to understand the disease, the spectrum of the disease, how it progresses, and ultimately how to monitor that. So all those uh, needs need to be addressed in order to accelerate drug development and ultimately the commercialization of a therapy. And our platform, which I'll introduce to you in a moment, uh, really addresses all those issues um, in, a very, um, in a very unique way. So what is Santogen's platform? Our platform is really a, um, a platform that combines the, the clinical genetic testing that enables us to uh, streamline and accelerate the develop development of treatments for rare diseases. On the right-hand side, you can see that we operate as a clinical diagnostics lab. We receive samples from more than 120 different countries around the world, and uh, we routinely test for more than 4,000 4, genetic disorders. Um, we capture the genetic information, the clinical information that's provided by the physician requesting the diagnosis, and of course, the biomaterial which I will introduce to you in a moment, um, most of the, bio, the biosamples that we receive are in the form of dried blood spots. So all this information is captured in the database, in the Centrogen repository, which is also enhanced by our uh, pharmaceutical collaborations, where for different uh, programs, there may be additional uh, genetic information that comes in. Um, so additional information that's coming into the repository, of course, all of that is in a de anonymized fashion, um, and of course, uh, with all the protection by the GDPR and other uh, confidentiality um, uh, and patient confidentiality needs. So everything is combined together in the Cento MD. This is our proprietary uh, repository, and uh, the, uh, the the anonymized uh, MD epidemiology uh, information, the phenotypical data, the genetic data, and of course, uh, some of the things that we will discuss today, uh, data from proteomics and metabolomics um, analysis is also captured to ultimately have a very large amount of data points reflecting um, um, uh, more than 500,000 patients at this moment in time. So, what is CentOMD? This repository of information that I just uh, I just introduced to you it is really a very unique curated repository. And uh, when we say curated, uh, what we mean is that the information that is provided by the uh, the physicians who request a uh, a sample to uh, to be tested um, is going through a uh, a quality uh, process where we actually uh, transcribe the uh, the information that's provided by the clinician 
into a standardized medical language. And so ultimately, uh, what we have in CentOMD are the test results, the clinical information in a way that is uh, standardized and, and uh, in a uniform fashion, so we can always do searches for specific terms, uh, medical terms. We have a biobank of the samples. And of course, uh, we also have the original request of the physician, which gives us uh, some hints uh, as to uh, what the condition of the patient um, was at the time of, of the request. And so at this point, we have a very large database, uh, more than 500,000 patients, uh, individual patients that were analyzed. And of course, all of those are um, individuals who have uh, symptoms uh, that, uh, that prompted the request for analysis. So these are, by and large, uh, individuals that have um, disorders that could not be diagnosed uh, easily. And of course, uh, this is a, uh, a very different from other databases that contain uh, information about um, healthy individuals. This is a population that, of course, uh, all is uh, unfortunately affected by some kind of, uh, of a disorder. Um, interestingly enough, uh, we have uh, about 60% of the, uh, the variants, the genetic variants uh, that were identified are unique to this population. And the reason is that um, our sample comes from um, more than 120 countries around the world. So it's very, very ethnically uh, diverse. And uh, we, up we update the, uh, the database on a regular basis, including reclassify the variants uh, when we have uh, new knowledge that would uh, make a decision about whether a variant is pathogenic or not, um, uh, as updated as possible. The scale of the database um, is really very large, particularly uh, when it focuses on uh, individuals affected by rare diseases. Okay, so we're uh, on slide uh, number nine, and uh, this is really a way to, uh, to share our uh, value proposition. And this is uh, uh, to illustrate that, that uh, the solutions that we can, uh, that we can provide really uh, span the entire spectrum of research clinical development and commercialization. And so we are um, uh, looking at uh, more than uh, 7,000 diseases that we, can, uh, that we can target. All of them are in the orphan disease space. And uh, using genomics, we can uh, certainly uh, look at novel target discovery, target validation, and of course, assay development uh, to support that. And uh, in the, uh, the clinical development phase, um, we are able through our database, as I described earlier, to identify uh, potential study sites, uh, patients, and, uh, and potentially look for enrollment into clinical trials. So um, this is really the part of the, uh, the services that we develop. And ultimately, even through the commercialization phase, um, genetic testing services, companion uh, diagnostics, and prevalence studies are things that we can uh, do based on the, uh, um, the repository that I described to you earlier. <clears throat> slide, slide number 10 introduces our main, uh, the main way in which we collect samples from around the world. And this is a uniquely simple and efficient solution for sample collection. Um, we call it the Cento card. And it is a, um, uh, a filter paper uniquely designed to capture blood, drug blood dried blood spots. Uh, we only need uh, less than one ml of blood to be, uh, to be put on the, uh, on the card. And uh, then, of course, uh, the, uh, the blood dries in about two hours, and it can be shipped uh, just using regular mail. This is not a biohazard. And, um, and we know that the uh, dried blood spots are stable for at least uh, 12 years, which is the longest that we've been able to, uh, to test. Uh, the sample cards are available in multiple languages with instructions on how to, uh, to collect the sample. Uh, each card has its own barcode, so it's easy to track the samples and make sure that uh, they get to the right test uh, that is needed. And of course, uh, this is all accompanied by the patient's consent uh, for uh, not only the test itself, but for potential um, other um, uh, tests or, uh, or analysis uh, based on the patient's consent. So all of that is really at the basis of, uh, um, of, of our routine work, and this is now uh, really ready to be used uh, to identify, uh, in addition to, uh, to the genetic testing, 
also to identify potential biomarkers, uh, as, uh, as I mentioned, for the use in the, um, in the process of drug development. What is a biomarker? The ideal characteristics of a biomarker in a rare disease would be a molecule that identifies uh, the risk for a specific disease. We're looking for something that would assess the disease severity and help us understand how disease progress progresses. Uh, and ultimately, a biomarker that could uh, guide us uh, in how we use treatment. So a biomarker is really a, a unique mo molecule. It can be um, used as an enzyme activity to measure enzyme activity. It could be proteins, it could be nucleic acids, or it could be metabolites. What we'll focus our discussion today is how we use metabolites and smaller molecules as potential biomarkers. So. Our approach to uh, biomarker discovery uh, is really based on um, uh, the fact that we receive those, uh, uh, those samples from around the world. Uh, these are all patients uh, that were uh, identified through our clinical testing uh, services. And, um, and we use the, uh, uh, the central card, the dry blood spot, as the source of material. And our approach is essentially, uh, conceptually very simple as illustrated uh, on this slide, on slide 12. What we do is uh, we take uh, uh, samples from, uh, uh, from patients who share the same genetic, uh, I guess the same genetic variant and the same phenotype. So this is the cohort that we'll be studying. And we're comparing that cohort with a larger cohort of um, uh, individuals who may be affected by other disorders, but not uh, that particular uh, genetic disorder. And then uh, we use uh, primarily um, uh, uh, mass spectrometry as a way to, uh, to analyze those samples and compare the, uh, the patient's material uh, from, the, uh, from the control group. And so at this point, it's really it's an aggregated uh, analysis of all those individuals and comparing the two, uh, the two groups, really looking for the unique uh, signatures of the, um, of the patient population. Now, why, uh, why is this uh, approach uh, working? Uh, well, because we, uh, we can standardize um, all of the materials uh, that are received as dry blood spots. So that really provides a simple uh, technological approach uh, to, uh, to analyzing those samples. Um, we have developed a very, uh, a very specific uh, workflow to make sure that all those uh, studies are done in the same way, and that uh, we can start the discovery process almost immediately based on the biobank uh, consent and samples that we already have. So that really, really reduces the time to start a discovery program by probably about a year, year and a half, which is usually the time that it takes to, uh, to have the IRB approvals and collect samples. And since we have those samples in our biobank and they are consent, consented for further analysis, we can start the discovery uh, process right away. And of course, uh, in, this, uh, in this process, we can look for known uh, biomarkers and uh, test them in this, uh, on this platform. But obviously, more importantly, we can look for novel biomarkers. And so that the way that, uh, that we do that is we, uh, we compare uh, the cohorts, as I, as I just described. Um, using artificial intelligence has really uh, remarkably accelerated uh, that process. In the past, uh, the comparison between the cohorts was done manually, and now we do that uh, with, um, uh, with AI. And uh, that means that uh, studies that took us months to analyze before now really require um, only uh, a few days. And that means that we can do many more discovery programs uh, at any given moment in time. And um, uh, Peter, is there anything that you wanted to, uh, to add at this point uh, about the biomarker discovery process? Yeah, I think uh, well, what uh, we really realized in the last months and years is that uh, by speeding up the process and giving more uh, precision to the selection of samples, uh, we have learned that we can really have a differentiation not only on the type of disease, but going down from the genetic disorders to uh, sub-phenotypes in disorders where, for example, the renal involvement in Fabry was uh, caught by a biomarker, or we can have biomarkers that help us to predict mild and severe 
forms of disease of the very same genetic disorder and by that of course uh, have insights into not only uh, the disease but as well modifiers of disease which is uh, uh, a great value beyond just uh, a state biomarker like discussed so far. Great, thank you. So um, we'll transition now to use a particular uh, biomarker that we wanted to uh, to share with you today as a case study, uh, and this is really a biomarker that uh, that is used uh, for Gaucher disease. And uh, we'd like to uh, to to examine how uh, the use of uh, of, of biomarker um, really accelerates all those uh, various steps uh, along the the drug development and commercialization uh, spectrum. Um, and use uh, Gaucher disease as, uh, as a way to illustrate that. So the first, uh, the first part, we'll look at uh, how can uh, a biomarker be developed rapidly to enable patient identification, recruitment, uh, and stratification in clinical trials. And, uh, and we'll look at uh, Gaucher disease as a way to, uh, to illustrate that. So for those of you uh, who are not familiar with Gaucher disease, this is a genetic uh, disease it is defined as a storage uh, disease. It is caused by a specific uh, mutation in an enzyme. Uh, that enzyme uh, typically uh, breaks down a, a molecule to its uh, fatty and, uh, and sugar um, moieties. Uh, but in the case of Gaucher patients, they really cannot do that uh, effectively. So uh, there's, a, uh, there's a storage material that begins to accumulate, and that storage material is really responsible for the, um, uh, for the pathology of, uh, of, of the disease. The challenges of, of Gaucher disease, which is a disease that has been uh, studied for, uh, for many years um, and uh, at this point uh, has a specific treatment, but the challenges are that uh, it's a very heterogeneous uh, disease. Genotype-phenotype correlations exist, but they're really not sufficient to predict the clinical course in many of the cases. On the right-hand side, you can actually see uh, um, some patients who are all affected um, by the same, uh, the same genetic variation. In this case, it's actually one of the most uh, uh, severe variants of this disease. Uh, but you can see that the spectrum of patients could be from a relatively mild uh, on the left and to very severe patients on the right-hand side. And all of them have the same uh, genetic variant. So we know that uh, genetics alone cannot uh, tell us the entire story, and, uh, and of course the progression of the disease can still vary. And although um, the disease is, is uh, caused by this enzyme deficiency, we also know that uh, reduced uh, enzyme levels are not correlated with the disease severity. And you can see that in the graph on the lower uh, right, uh, right corner. You can see that the residual activity really does not correlate well uh, at all with, uh, with severity. So we can't really use the, uh, the, genetic, the genetics alone. We can't really use the, um, the enzyme activity, although they are the hallmark of the disease, hallmarks of the disease. We, can, yep, we cannot use them reliably to understand the clinical, uh, the clinical features. And uh, of course, other uh, clinically relevant endpoints may take months or years to observe uh, so for monitoring or for clinical development, um, those endpoints would be, uh, would be very difficult to, to use. So here we'd like to introduce Lyto GP1, uh, also known as, uh, uh, as, as uh, uh, Sphingosine, which is a biomarker that is used um, uh, in, in Gaucher disease. This is a biomarker that, uh, that we developed uh, and uh, we'll introduce you to some uh, the proprietary methods that, uh, that we've incorporated. And uh, it is currently uh, um, thought of as the most uh, sensitive and specific biomarker for Gaucher disease um, as defined in the literature. The first and most important aspect of using LISO GP1 is that it's extremely sensitive um, uh, to, uh, to identify Patients, patients with Gaucher disease. And so uh, we know that uh, the affected individuals have uh, higher levels uh, of lysogb one whereas carriers and, uh, and healthy controls have uh, lower levels of this, uh, of this biomarker. 
Uh, that's very important because enzyme levels, which were used to uh, initially to uh, to diagnose patients, actually have overlap between carriers and uh, and some affected individuals. So lazo GB1 is really 100% uh, uh, sensitive to identify patients uh, with uh, with the disease. So that is very important from the perspective of identifying uh, identifying patients. In addition to that. Um, we can see that lysol GB1 could be really used uh, very, uh, very effectively uh, to help us understand uh, genetic uh, variations and clinical um, in patients with uh, uh, with clinical subtypes. Um, here you can see a number of, of patients, even with uh, the same uh, the same mutations or other mutations. And uh, one of the interesting uh, aspects is that um, they have very uh, varying levels of lysol GB1. Um, in this particular study, uh, the, uh, the authors were trying to, to understand whether the severity um, of, the, um, of the, the symptoms is uh, associated with higher levels. And you can see that um, on the right-hand side, there's a group of patients who refused treatment, although they, uh, they were offered the treatment, uh, they were the most, uh, the most severe patients. So in clinical practice, and of course in, uh, in clinical studies, lysol GP1, could be uh, used very effectively uh, to really uh, um, ascertain which patients are more severe and who would really benefit uh, from treatment. Lysol GB1 um, is also uh, very well correlated with the disease uh, burden. In this case, uh, we can see the, uh, the patients and, uh, um, and their uh, platelet count is, um, uh, is analyzed with respect to the lysol of GB1 uh, level. And of course, we can see that uh, platelet count, which is uh, one of the symptoms uh, associated with the disease, is very well correlated in the, um, in the untreated, uh, in the untreated uh, uh, patient. And of course, that's really the, uh, the group uh, at baseline. And with, uh, with treatment, that, uh, that correlation uh, uh, disappears. So that's telling us that, uh, that of course, increased lysol GB1 associated with low platelet count um, can really help us understand, again, who are the patients uh, that are uh, more severe and who are the patients who are, who are less severe. And it also gives us a hint that uh, that changes with, uh, with treatment. So, um, how can these tools be used in addition to, uh, to understanding how patients, um, um, how patients can be identified, how can patients be, um, can be um, correlated with the disease severity? Uh, it is also very important to see how we can uh, use a biomarker to monitor response to therapy and ultimately make sure that we can improve uh, health, um, uh, health and, and economic outcomes. So um, in this slide, uh, you can see that uh, the, um, the, the level of lysol GP1, the biomarker that is measured, uh, in this case, again, all, uh, all from, uh, from the blood, that the lysol GP1 is actually uh, correlated very nicely with, uh, uh, with treatment. And so uh, on the left-hand side, you can see the overall uh, effect of, uh, of therapy. This is months on enzyme replacement therapy. Uh, measured in, uh, in this case in months, so you can see that it goes for years. And uh, many of the patients respond quite quickly with a reduction in life with GP1, but overall you can see that the correlation between the levels of the biomarker and the, uh, and the control uh, gained by, by therapy is, uh, is extremely high. So that really tells us there's a very rapid uh, reduction in life with GP1, and it correlates very nicely with other endpoints. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see other studies that were done in this particular case. This, these were patients um, who, started, uh, who started treatment, and you can see that there's a very sharp uh, reduction in lysol GB1, uh, meaning that it's a very, re uh, very responsive um, a biomarker that can really tell us quite quickly if treatment uh, is effective or not. So, of course, that is really a, a very important aspect in the clinical development program if you wanted to, uh, to understand whether therapy uh, has the potential to, uh, to provide any benefit or not, you can rely on the lysol GP1 biomarker to indicate that.
But this is not only true for, uh, for cohorts of patients, it actually really uh, uh, useful in the clinical setting to, uh, to monitor individuals. In this case, you can see uh, uh, one patient, uh, the red line uh, shows you the level of the biomarker of lysogb one um, and the shaded area is the, um, uh, is the therapeutic window. This is the range in which we would like to see the patient maintain uh, their lysogb one level. So uh, this is a patient that's been followed uh, every couple of weeks, and uh, you can see that initially the, uh, the biomarker level is in the right, uh, the right uh, range. It's, uh, it's doing uh, quite well. Uh, then the patient had an elevation uh, of the lysa GP1. You can see that it uh, goes outside of the, uh, the therapeutic window, uh, and in this case, uh, dose adjustment uh, was made, uh, which was followed by a reduction in the lysa GP1, so it's going in the right direction. Unfortunately, uh, the patient uh, developed um, in, uh, one of the most debilitating aspects of, uh, of the disease, which is a bone crisis, and this happened exactly when uh, the, uh, the lysogy demand level, the biomarker level, uh, was, uh, was, uh, was increasing. So uh, now we know that uh, the lysogy B1 biomarker can actually uh, predict um, a change in the clinical condition. In this case, another dose adjustment was, uh, was needed, uh, and in fact, uh, two dose adjustments were needed before finally uh, the patient was under control again. So this is a, this is a very nice illustration how uh, evidence-based uh, treatment uh, optimization can be done, and that, of course, is critical for market access and uh, to gain the support of, uh, of payers. Uh, as a reminder, uh, those, those adjustments obviously have uh, um, uh, clinical, uh, not only clinical consequences, but also financial consequences. So making sure that uh, evidence can, uh, can really support uh, increase or change in those are going to be very, uh, very appreciated uh, by the payers. So uh, we covered uh, how the lysa gb one biomarker can be used uh, to identify patients, uh, to, uh, to stratify them into uh, different uh, clinical uh, subgroups. Uh, we can see how they, uh, the biomarker can be used in a, um, in a clinical trial setting and in a clinical setting, but ultimately uh, can it also help us um, identify patients who are at high risk um, and really uh, and make sure that the diagnosis obviously uh, is shortened and the patients are identified um, as quickly as, uh, as possible. So how can the biomarker be used uh, for that? In order to do that, we've developed a, uh, a very cost-effective method, again, using our stental card and the dried blood spot as the, uh, the way to, uh, to do that. Um, and uh, we've incorporated all of that into a, um, uh, into a simple workflow that is that is illustrated here. We collect the, uh, the dry blood spot. It could also be an EDTA blood, uh, but in any case, we, uh, we put it on the, uh, on the dry blood spot, and uh, we do both an enzymatic test, which can be done, uh, can be measured directly from the, uh, the, uh, the central cord, from the dry blood spot. Uh, we also do the control enzyme, and uh, looking at the biomarker, in this case, lysogv one and uh, all those cases uh, that, can, that have normal levels of the, uh, the enzyme and the biomarker would be reported as uh, negative for, uh, in this case, for Gaucher disease. However, if they are positive um, and we see that uh, there's an elevation uh, of the biomarker and a reduced level of the enzyme, uh, those cases will be suspected as uh, pathogenic. And those samples will undergo uh, the, the, the gene sequencing uh, in order to, uh, to, uh, to ultimately validate that the patients are, uh, are identified and diagnosed correctly based on both the genetics as well as the biomarker. Now, since the biomarker approach and the enzymatic approach uh, use a, um, uh, the dry blood spot and uh, mass spectrometry, it is actually a, a much less costly process compared to testing uh, all those samples for the genetics, which is still um, would be more, uh, more expensive. So that really provides an extremely simple and, uh, um, and cost-effective way for high-risk uh, patients uh, who are at a high-risk population to be screened um, for, uh, for a particular disease, and in this case, uh, utilized with GP1 uh, for Gaucher disease. 
And of course, you can use that uh, in a very large, uh, very large setting because of the ease of use, uh, the simplicity of uh, of the method, and the uh, and the reduced cost uh, compared to genetic testing. So um, the the last part that we wanted to uh, to cover with respect to uh, to life with GB1 is uh, now that we are uh, we we've seen how it can be used in uh, drug development, uh, clinical development. And ultimately, in the commercial setting, we've actually uh, went back and uh, did more uh, basic uh, science work to understand the role of life with GB1. And uh, Peter, if you could uh, now introduce how we're using this approach um, uh, in the target discovery and validation uh, process, and what have we learned about life with GB1? Uh, Peter, please. So on slide uh, 25, you can see that uh, we've actually done uh, interesting studies to understand the role the pathophysiological role uh, of lysa GP1 uh, in Gaucher disease. And it looks like uh, this uh, uh, glucose uh, uh, sphingosine actually causes, uh, when it's uh, uh, administered to, um, uh, uh, to mice in a study that, that we've, uh, we've conducted, um, lysa GP1 actually uh, induces uh, hematological and visceral changes in the mice. So you can see that the, uh, uh, their um, hemoglobin levels are going down, and uh, this was very, uh, very well correlated uh, with the levels of um, uh, of lysol GB1. Okay, so I think what uh, Ovid said about lysol GB1 has uh, another facet uh, when we ask the question whether this marker is just um, a a passenger of the pathophysiology or whether this marker is driving pathophysiology of the disease. And to understand this in more detail, um, we uh, set up an experiment by injecting uh, the very, uh, exactly this marker into mice, healthy mice. And um, we could see that these mice start to mimic uh, features of Gaucher disease which is anemia shown here in the graph of uh, the uh, hemoglobin values uh, in uh, treated and untreated mice over 12 weeks, and as well the hematocrit. And we've seen as well that uh, they develop a splenomegaly, which is not shown on the slide. However, this gives us some confidence that uh, this biomarker is um, potentially more than just uh, something to identify patients. It is something where we can study pathophysiology and uh, use this marker elevated in patients to find molecules that modify the value of, uh, of this marker. And so in the next step, we uh, started developing preclinical models for Gaucher disease in this case, where we derived uh, fibroblasts from patients, reprogrammed them into iPSCs, uh, and then differentiated these iPSCs into macrophages, where uh, the most part of the pathophysiology of Gaucher disease is happening. And we could see that not only we were able to generate patient-derived macrophages, but uh, on top, we could see that these macrophages are active they do phagocyte uh, detriment of uh, the cell culture media. I cannot show a movie here today, but uh, this uh, macrophage uh, in the uh, down pain uh, really is active and endocytizing uh, fragments of erythrocytes, uh, which is a physiological function of macrophages. So we have a functional model with or without the genetic defect, which is the GBA uh, homozygous missense variant. Uh, and so uh, we seeded these cells, cultured them, uh, and took uh, from the media and from the cell pellets measurements again of Lysa GB1, which was highly elevated in uh, the patient cell lines with the defect as compared with controls. And so this showed us that we can use the biomarker as well in preclinical models that mimic the pathophysiology. And now, of course, we have a fantastic tool to do drug screening, drug uh, compound validation, 
since we uh, recapture aspects of the disease just in a dish. So this is kind of a study in a dish approach where the biomarker is the linking tool between the patient and the cell line we use for the screening or the validation. And I think from there, uh, it's back to you, Obed, to describe the value and how we make the, uh, the offers to our partners. Thank you, but maybe just a quick question that came from the audience. Um, using lazo GB1 in the diagnosis of patients, uh, Peter, did we ever come across a patient with normal lazo GB1 that did have a pathogenic mutation? Well, of course we have normal lazo GB1 and uh, no mutations in all controls and healthy individuals. Uh, typical Gaucher patient um, with mutations always has elevated levels, so this is a very, very uh, specific and sensitive marker. Um, we learned that uh, nonetheless a rare other genetic disorder, which is uh, prosapacine deficiency, the activator of uh, glucoceramidase, uh, also leads to elevation of lysogb one levels. But also we have screened hundreds of diseases. We have not come across other rare diseases with elevated lysogb one levels except for Gaucher disease and prosapacine P deficiency. Um, the other way around, of course, sometimes we have patients with typical symptoms with high lyso gb one levels and no mutations in genetic screening. And these are sometimes the hard nuts where uh, complex uh, genetic variants at the locus uh, escape our standard diagnostic approach where only long read sequencing uh, helps us to understand, uh, for example, complex rearrangements that are not so rare in the Gaucher disease. So this happens, but usually it tells us something about the, um, the bottlenecks or the, the sensitivity gaps of next generation sequencing. Since we have not seen patients with high levels uh, and a typical clinical picture uh, that we could not diagnose with Gaucher disease. Sometimes we had to work hard on the genetic mm -hmm. uh, basis. Great. Thank you, Peter. So um, really to summarize uh, this, uh, this combination of the, uh, the clinical information uh, that comes from the diagnostics, uh, the samples, our way to, uh, to standardize the method using dry blood spots to, uh, to generate uh, biomarkers and to, uh, to use them um, in, a, in, in a, a clinical or an experimental setting really provide a lot of value for um, uh, drug developers across the spectrum of, uh, of development, all the way from uh, early discovery uh, through development and commercialization. But perhaps more importantly, really provides a lot of value for patients uh, where ultimately early and correct diagnosis is possible, uh, which in turn can lead uh, to access to, uh, to therapies or other, um, other therapeutic options. And, uh, and of course, as, uh, as we could see, uh, can lead to, uh, to improved outcomes using, uh, using the biomarkers in this, uh, in this case. So we hope that, uh, that we were able to, uh, to uh, illustrate using the LASO GB1 uh, really, uh, uh, how ultimately a biomarker could, could be used in all those uh, in all those settings, um, and I think that uh, we've all learned over the years that uh, the developing uh, development and commercialization of therapies for orphan, uh, orphan diseases is not straightforward. is not easy. It requires a, a multi-omic approach to bridge the knowledge from genetics to function and to clinical outcomes. And as Peter just said, sometimes we do it uh, uh, backwards. After we've learned things in the clinic, we go back to um, uh, to the lab and uh, and fine tune those uh, those tools. Uh, the biomarkers are critical to make these connections. I think we've uh, we've learned a great deal uh, from biomarkers, both about function and about uh, genetics. So they really uh, provide us with a very critical uh, connection. And, uh, and finally, our, our uh, unique platform, Synthogen's unique platform and capabilities can offer tailored solutions uh, to achieve these goals. So thank you for, uh, for, uh, for the patience. And uh, Justin, um, did we get any uh, questions? 
Yes, um, thank you. A few of you have already submitted questions, so we're going to jump right in. Um, the first question, can multi approach improve the diagnostics of new patients? Okay, so Peter, I'll, I'll let you answer then. I'll just... Uh, yeah, I think I should take... I should take sure. your question here. Thank you. Um, what we really uh, use multi-omics for is uh, in case uh, like this one presented and recently published, we uh, do genetic sequencing. Uh, this was a nematic type uh, AB patient with a deficiency of acid single myelinase, so a different disease from that we presented before. However, in this uh, Sri Lankan uh, family, Variants that have not been uh, described before have been found uh, in the SMPD1 gene. Now, formally, you would say, well, this is a variant of uncertain significance because uh, this missense alleles cannot be validated towards pathogenicity. With our biomarker and multi-omic approach, we were able to identify a molecule called, called LISO SM509 which is another derivative of uh, uh, the lysosomal pathways. Uh, and this molecule we knew is high in patients with single myelin nice deficiency. So as shown by more than 100 patients validated before this family hit our door in the diagnostic field. And uh, with a high level of this biomarker of more than five nanogram per milliliter, we were able to say, well, we have functional proof that there is impairment of uh, this enzymatic activity because the biomarker tells us this uh, independent of the genetic result. And by that, we have been able to reclassify variants into likely pathogenic variants and thereby uh, secure a diagnosis which would otherwise have stayed uncertain. Great. Thank you. Andrew, do we have uh, time for more questions? Yes, yes uh, we definitely do. What other biomarkers are you developing? So, Peter, would you, uh, uh, would you like yeah, well, to uh, take this long Yeah, sure. There's a long list of projects we are running right now, and uh, you already heard that uh, there's uh, 50 markers per year in the pipeline. This one uh, for, for us to share with you is a biomarker for uh, TTR amyloidosis, so uh, dominant uh, pathogenic variants in the transtyrosine receptor gene. Uh, and in this case as well, we, we, we started doing the metabolomic search on molecules uh, linked to the clear genetic cases and compared with controls. and um, in this disease, we came up with a pattern of biomarkers, even highlighting a, a new pathway, which we are now elaborating. I cannot share today, but uh, this uh, told us a completely new story of pathophysiology of uh, uh, amyloidosis, at least in genetic form. And so um, with these tools at hand, we can really unlock insights into undiagnosed rare diseases now having even screening markers for this rare but treatable disease. Brilliant. Thank you, Peter. Next question. Can a biomarker help expand the market? I think that there's a very general answer to that, sure, because uh, if you would like to identify patients by uh, genetic means, uh, you would have to uh, invest a lot into technology while the filter card and the biomarker is an uh, accessible, globally distributable tool to uh, test uh, suspected patients for uh, rare genetic diseases and thereby identify patients, which is an expansion of the market. The other aspect illustrated here is as well that when we combine uh, 
the clinical information and the clinical biomarker with uh, screening of uh, patient-derived cell lines, uh, we can expand as well into the preclinical phase and give guidance to uh, pharma partners where and how to develop uh, compounds and targets uh, with uh, always the link back into the patient uh, where we have uh, the primary source where it should then in the end hit the target. Thank you. Have you seen any patients or family members who have reported symptoms of Parkinson's where lipogb one are also raised? Yeah, that's a very good question and uh, you are alluding to the uh, shortcut from GBA uh, dysfunction or maybe um, yeah, defects uh, and the risk to develop Parkinson's disease. We have uh, seen consistently elevated carrier levels in lysogb one in uh, symptomatic patients. Uh, symptomatic in this case means having heterozygous GBA variants and Parkinson's disease. However, um, also this is a trend. We don't have a really uh, statistical evidence on that in the data we've seen. We're just working on a uh, publication for uh, this cohort as well. So I think the data will be shared uh, by mid of the year. Uh, however, they never have high levels like Gaucher disease patients. So the cutoff for a clear Gaucher disease diagnosis is 10 nanogram per milliliter, uh, while the Gaucher Parkinson patients have uh, around five uh, if they are heterozygous for a GBA variant. Thank you. And a, a few more questions for you. Um, can you speak to any specific partnership in orphan drug development support? So, okay, yeah, maybe I can yeah, take, take that one. Yeah, go ahead, Justin. Go ahead. Okay. So, I just, uh, I think, uh, I think it's critical to understand, um, you know, where Sensitine plays across the value chain within pharma. So, um, you know, not only in the in the uh, in the early stage target discovery, but also, you know, accelerating clinical trials and, and enrollment, um, as well as the commercialization of, of products. And so we've we've now successfully put many partnerships in place, uh, mainly focused around rare diseases, although some in, in other areas like Parkinson's disease. Um, I can speak to a few, um, and these are publicly, uh, in the public domain. Um, there is an early stage uh, target discovery um, program where we're using the repository to identify potential new genetic targets um, across the board, and that is with a company called Pfizer, I'm sure you're all aware of. Um, in the clinical space, we're working with a company called Denali Therapeutics um, to help accelerate um, uh, the identification of patients with a specific mutation in Parkinson's disease called LARC2. Um, and uh, not only identify those patients, but um, um, think of different ways to uh, accelerate uh, uh, patient enrollment into Denali clinical studies. Um, and so I'll leave you with those those two examples. Another question: uh, Do you use biomarkers and cell lines models for drug discovery? I think uh, this is really a powerful tool uh, where uh, directly the, not only the, the, the mutation of patients, but as well the genetic background, which is often the modifiers I talked about uh, in the first part of the presentation, are uh, modeled. And so, for example, for Gishi disease, we have seen that um, the very same mutation uh, has very different lysogb one levels in patients. And we see the very same as well in the cell lines that are derived from those patients. So uh, this is what we call genetic modifiers. Uh, and beyond just the observation, 
these factors, genetic factors that uh, lead to more severe or milder phenotypes are so essential to understand for next steps in uh, compound, compound validation, for example, that uh, this is a tremendous insight into the real life of uh, how, uh, how the, the, the genetic defects um, are understood and uh, can as well be attacked or modified. And how would you say your database is different from other databases that are out there? Yeah, that's as well as an important question, and maybe I think we have a slide for that as well. Yeah. So uh, the most uh, differentiating uh, observation is that we have an ethnically diverse database. Since we are receiving samples from all over the world, and this is due to the access to even remote uh, countries by using the filter card as an easy logistic tool. We have, meanwhile, 30% of the cases from the Middle East. We have many cases from South America uh, and, uh, of course, good coverage in Europe uh, and as well in Asia. This means, and North Africa, not to forget, this means that we see more variability, uh, which gives us more colors, more modifiers of disease, and thereby, again, in turn, more insights into uh, what is a systematic observation, what is a local observation, and as well in the validation of targets or biomarkers, is this biomarker really unique for a global population of patients, or do we have to make breakdowns into different geographic origins? Thank you. And the final question that we can fit in today, um, what kind of filter paper to make your sample blood spots from for patients? So what kind of filter paper do you use to make your sample blood spots for patients? Is there any special treatment for blood sample stability? Uh, no, there's no treatment. So it's uh, really a filter paper the commercial one that you can get for neonatal screening as well. Uh, in the US, it's called the Perkin Elmer paper. Also, it's produced by Alstrom, uh, uh, a huge uh, filter paper uh, factory. And so uh, we use it and can uh, have seen stability uh, over years for our biosamples and no need to uh, add any chemicals for preservation. Just let the blood dry immediately after it has been dropped on the paper. And then after two hours, the sample is stable for years without refrigeration. And um, it's really just a stupid piece of paper, but a beautiful one. Thank you. Well, I'm afraid we've run out of time. Thank you very much, Dr. and Dr. Peter Bauer for that great presentation, and our sponsor, Centogene, for making this event possible. On behalf of Centogene and Informa Pharma Intelligence, have a productive remainder of the day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.